Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimble Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. Today, we're joined by Nasreen Mastafazadeh, Senior AI Research Scientist at New York-based Elemental Cognition. Our conversation focuses on Nasreen's work in event-centric contextual modeling in language and vision, which she sees as a means of giving AI systems a bit of common sense. We discuss Nasreen's work on the Story Close Test, which is a reasoning framework for evaluating story understanding and generation. We explore the details of this task, including what constitutes a story and some of the challenges it presents and approaches for solving it. We also discuss how you model what a computer understands, building semantic representation algorithms, different ways to approach explainability, and multimodal extensions to her contextual modeling work. Enjoy. All right, everyone, I am on the line with Nasreen Mastafazadeh. Nasreen is a senior AI research scientist at Elemental Cognition in New York City. Nasreen, welcome to This Week in Machine Learning and AI. Thanks, Sam. Thanks for having me. So I hear that you started working on AI in high school. Tell us a little bit about that story. Sure. Yeah. So I was into computer science and computer engineering in general. Like when I was a kid, you know, I basically that was the the toy that I had. And I always loved the idea of doing something meaningful with it in the sense that, okay, I'm spending a lot of time in front of computer doing different stuff. What is the best thing that you can accomplish? And somehow I was introduced to the notion of uh, programming and the fact that you can build like pieces of software to do things for you. And to me, the idea of building a piece of software that kind of automates what you do was really intriguing, which is how I got into robotics initially. So, you know, I started working on uh, robotics with a couple of my really great friends back in high school that, uh, you know, it ended up, we ended up competing in RoboCop competitions, which is this, uh, you know, annual worldwide uh, competitions uh, among different roboticists to, you know, accomplish different uh, tasks, basically, with robots. And yeah, so the story, you know, will go forward with like how I did that for like a year and a half, and it was fantastic, and we accomplished a lot. And Um, I was always under the impression that it's actually a very complex task, right? You build these multi-agent systems that are capable of integrating their word model with, like, different communications within the agents and, like, control aspects like mechanics, imagine electronics, and all those sorts of things are really complex. And then um, somehow through through some things that I'm not going to tell the story of today, uh, I got introduced to the idea that natural language understanding and natural language processing as a field in general is much more complex than uh, robotics. And that kind of blew my mind. Like, uh, as I said, I thought I'm working on something that is, you know, super high tech, which it was, but turned out that Uh, At the time, this is like 12 years ago, um, there were no AI systems that could do natural language understanding at the level of a four-year-old kid. So this was an interesting challenge for me to take, which is how I kind of switched gears and started working on natural language understanding and natural language processing since then. And so the focus of your work since then has been largely centered around this idea of event-centric contextual modeling in language and vision. What exactly mm-hmm. does that mean? Yeah, so um, I think we can you know, start with the events first, right? Uh, so I've always been interested in looking at the world, basically, through the lens of events, because events are such central entities of the world through which we, you know, go about our daily lives. We see things that happen as a result of some stuff that happened, which is an event. So an event can cause something else. And then our understanding of the dynamics of such events and how they shape our world on a day-to-day basis is really, you know, crucial part of uh, any kind of cognitive ability. And that makes, you know, me and a lot of other AI scientists uh, very interested in modeling events. 
Uh, so that's the event-centric part. And then the context modeling is about, okay, uh, I have an AI system. I want to build an AI system that can get an input and then produce some sort of an output, right? That input could be something super complex. Imagine an entire world being perceived by a situated robot, or it could be a piece of text, right? Or it could be a piece of, uh, you know, an input, which is multimodal. So both text and an input. So that's where what context means in my work, basically. So contextual modeling means how would the AI system deal with representing and understanding the input that is provided with. And then the language and vision part is basically where I've applied this set of, you know, uh, you know, different pieces of work on event-centric contextual modeling. I am, a, you know, in nature, I'm a natural language processing researcher, but I've worked on applying different, uh, you know, AI, uh, you know, uh, methodologies basically in the world of vision and language, which has become, you know, more hot basically in the past uh, three years or so. So what are some of the types of problems that you come up with and, and try to solve in this context of event-centric contextual modeling? So there are different aspects of the world that we can basically see through the lens of events, right? Uh, one major uh, piece of work that I've done is on inst- understanding stories, right? As you can imagine, narratives or stories are these sequence of really eventful Uh, sentences that we, you know, basically uh, have to go through on a daily basis because as humans, uh, we tell stories all the time, right? When we communicate, stories are a major part of how we communicate with each other. And so uh, one of the, you know, lines of work that I've invested on in the past couple of years has been on narrative understanding or story understanding where you want to build AI systems that can read, uh, you know, a coherent sequence of sentences, which are event-centric in, in, you know, in nature, and then it should understand it in a way that it can answer questions about it, and more so that it could also be able to generate meaningful stories. So this this work, you know, basically involves not only understanding a piece of text which happens to be narrative, but also be able to generate, uh, you know, a sequence of sentences that go together coherently as a meaningful story. And so how do you tend to approach that type of problem? Uh, yeah, so, uh, the you know, there are different things that you should uh, take care of, right, if you want to build an AI system that can, say, understand stories. First and foremost is, okay, what is an even in the story, right? Are we talking about uh, like a, you know, novel by Shakespeare or are we talking about like a sequence of, I don't know, four words? There are, believe it or not, there are people who call sequence of five words also stories. Uh, so in my work, I've particularly, you know, focused on understanding a sequence of five sentence stories. So these are, uh, co- we call it common sense stories in a way that, we are uh, basically interested in understanding uh, the the most like daily things that happen to anyone, you know, in in general. That's why we call it common sense, and we go about understanding them. So that's the first thing you have to address, right? What is even in a story? Uh, after you address that, then you should think about okay, now I want to build a system that can understand uh, this this kind of an input, and then it goes about different you know steps that you should take. So one is okay, how do I even represent this piece of, uh, you know, input, which is a narrative? So it goes, you know, hand in hand with notions of knowledge representation. So in the AI community from like, you know, back, you know, decades ago, people invested a lot of time and effort on knowledge representation. And in the NLP community in particular, we have a lot of literature on semantic representation and meaning representation, right? Uh, So in my work, I'm mainly interested in extracting events, right? So what is in particular important about this story? Let's call those events and let's extract those and call it the kind of representation that I'm interested in. So that will be the basically the second thing you do. And then the third thing is, okay, now I want to, you know, basically connect the dots. What, how do I know what are the stereotypical relations that ex- exist between these events in a story? And then that will give you this so-called narrative structure of a story that you can basically get in as an input to any other, you know, system that wants to, say, answer questions about this story. So that's more or less, you know, in big picture, how you would go about story modeling. 
Uh, so you started out with talking about how the first thing to understand is what is a story, but it strikes me that there's also this question, you know, what what do we even mean by understand uh, mm. when we're talking about a computer understanding mm. a story? And there's more to it necessarily than, you know, answering questions. How do you model or assess a computer's ability to understand a story? Or is that even, you know, part mm. of what you're trying to get at? Or is it more performance on individual tasks? Yeah, that's a very good question, right? And I would say a fundamental question for the entire AI community. So the way we go about defining what understanding even is in the field these days is through these benchmarks that we define, right? So actually, I personally, uh, you know, contributed to a benchmark for story understanding, which is a story close test. Uh, so we, so the, the the kind of benchmark we defined in particular was as follows. So the AI system is supposed to read a sequence of uh, four sentences, which is the context of uh, the story, basically. And then the task is to predict the ending to that story. So in the five sentences stories that I told you, you basically imagine that you drop the last sentence and the task for the AI system is to predict that. So I personally believe that uh, is a good uh, kind of a proxy for modeling whether or not a system is understanding the story that it has read. That's one way of putting it. But as it goes with many benchmarks in the uh, AI world, uh, whenever you have a task and you make it into a benchmark and then you collect a very particular narrow, in a sense, a test set for it, it could be hacked, right? And it goes uh, to... Uh, say that maybe we shouldn't just define understanding in terms of beating a particular benchmark, but more so deploying systems in the wild. So uh, I would say that there are different ways that you can define what true understanding even is. Uh, having benchmarks is a good way of making, you know, having proxies, right, and having basically evaluating ourselves as we move forward. Uh, but they're not the ultimate. Uh, this should not be the ultimate end goal, I would say, of uh, what we call true understanding. Uh, so I will go to, you know, to add that. Um, so understanding could be through the lens of answering questions, right? So I ask the system, what is the ending to this story? And if it answers it correctly, that means it understood, right? But as it goes, that it get it could be hacked, meaning that without true understanding, maybe a system, a black box system, can actually uh, specify the right ending. Uh, if we build systems that can explain themselves, uh, that could be a win, I would say. So, which is a focus that I have at Elemental Cognition now, where we are building AI systems, in particular, story understanding systems that can explain the decisions they make, and which is a better way of kind of. Uh, knowing what's behind the scenes and what's, you know, under the hood for the system that is making a decision. Before we dive into that, I, I want to make sure I understand the story close test. You uh, are training your system, presumably on some corpus of five sentence stories, and then you're giving it four sentences that form uh, some new unseen story and asking it to mm -hmm. complete the, the sentence. And yeah, it's to complete the story. Yes. To complete the story, right. So to yes. provide the exactly. the final sentence. And yes. in doing so, you demonstrate that it can draw out entities and uh, contexts from the story and present them in some way that makes sense. Is it, you know, does... Is a human grading the the responses? I guess the the origin mm -hmm. of that question is it strikes me that generally speaking, for this kind of task, you could have multiple correct output answers. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. exactly. So how does that work? Exactly. So that's actually what we did. We ended up collecting alternative endings, and then the AI you know system is posed with two alternatives. One is a wrong ending. One is the right ending, and then the task is to choose the right one. So that's actually the kind of a classification task that we ended up doing. Uh -huh. But as you can imagine, the task could be generation, right? The agent could be just posed with the four sentences, and then the task is to generate the ending, basically open-ended, right, as opposed to multi-choice uh, question. Uh, but yeah, for the actual story close test, we ended up collecting the right and wrong uh, endings by crowdsourcing. And then at the end of the day, uh, it becomes a classification task. In, in sourcing these answers, were you targeting 
uh, specific mechanisms of correctness, uh, meaning were you trying to test specific aspects of the algorithm? Uh, so, for example, I forget whose work this is. Maybe I've seen it in the context of Josh Tenenbaum's work, but this um, the idea that you know, within this concept of context, there's so much that's unsaid. Um, you know, the cup is on the table. You know, there are physical forces that, you know, keep the cup on the table. It's not going to fall unless some other force pushes it off, that kind of thing. Like, are you, it, I imagine you could create sentences that kind of test that common sense context, mm-hmm. or there are other things that you can target uh, to test with your sentences. Right. Yeah. So there are, you know, you can, I can imagine having stories that will, you know, kind of evaluate such cognitive abilities of a system. But the uh, point about the story clause test is that it's about generic daily life events uh, that happen to anyone, which is why they're called common sense. So I can give you an example. So this is an example, you know, a story clause test. So the context is as follows. Karen was assigned a roommate her first year of college. And then the story continues that her roommate asked her to go to a nearby city for a concert. And then Karen agreed happily. The show was uh, absolutely exhilarating. And then there are two alternative endings to the story. Uh, One is Karen became good friends with her roommate. And the wrong ending, uh, the second ending, which I gave it away, is the wrong ending is Karen hated her roommate. Right. So this is the level of complexity and generality, actually, that we are uh, tackling for the story close test. So it's really about a daily uh, story that has happened, can happen to anyone. And in particular, we have crowdsourced these, as I said, by very generic prompts to the workers. So it's it's more about predicting the next event, which happens to be the uh, you know ending to the story, yep. as opposed to the kind of phenomena that yeah you described. Was the algorithm trained only on similar stories or was it trained on other information that wasn't in that same story format? Yeah, so uh, we kind of set up this uh, challenge being the story close test so that people can do whatever they can to to accomplish the task. Uh, uh, So we did provide a a corpus of 100,000 stories called Rock Stories. These are full five sentence stories that actually people can use kind of as a as positive examples. They can mine, you know, narrative structures from them. They can build like models that predict like what happens next in the story and so on. But it's not directly labeled data for the task of story close test. And given that, we are we've left people, you know, free to use whatever corpora out there, whatever resources, common sense knowledge bases, or modeling uh, techniques that they have to tackle the task. So that's basically on our end. We wanted people to, you know, the research community to basically improvise and be creative and bring in their own resources. Um, so yeah, that that's that's about it. What kind of engagement or uptake have you seen on this test? Have you seen any interesting approaches to building out uh, algorithms to... Yeah. Yeah. So it happens that when... So the reason I made story close test in the first place is that there wasn't any, uh, you know, systematic way of evaluating story understanding in the field. So, you know, together with my colleagues, we ba- made this benchmark so that we uh, have a way of uh, evaluating our progresses moving forward in the field. And uh, because, as I said, there wasn't any such uh, benchmark in place, what we made actually got a lot of attention, specifically because we showed that human does 100% on this task. So we actually made sure that the test set that we put out there is uh, like, you know, doubly human verified so that there are no boundary cases for choosing the right uh, versus the wrong ending. Uh, and also the best, uh, you know, state of the art model that we, trade, uh, that we tried on the benchmark was getting some, somewhere around like 59%. And as you can imagine, random baseline would do 50% human was doing 100%. So there was like more than 40% gap between the best system results and the human performance. So, you know, these two characteristics, I would say, really contributed to the task getting a lot of attention. And, you know, since then, this was released about two years ago. A lot of teams, different teams, you know, from academia and industry have, have you know, tackled the task. There has been so many results. But I go back to the point that I made about hacking, right? So... 
after we released this data set for many months, maybe, uh, you know, eight, nine months, 10 months, there wasn't any significant improvement. And then we made it into a share task, meaning that, you know, we had a challenge and this workshop and it, w there was a prize right, for the winner up. And uh, then when, whenever you do that, there are uh, there are different approaches that will come at you, which is actually very healthy for a benchmark so that you know exactly what works and what doesn't. And in that, uh, you know, challenge that we ran, basically, that challenge day, uh, there was a team submission from UW that had found out that uh, actually without reading the context, which is the whole point about the, this natural language understanding framework, without reading the context, you can leverage some, uh, you know, stylistic features isolated in the endings, just <laughs> alone that, yeah, to, to find the right ending. And the interesting fact about this group is that, so the, you know, the, the guy that actually contributes to this model used to work on detecting uh, the fake Yelp previews and like detecting notions such as like age or gender from, from a piece of text. And it happened that turns out our wrong endings actually, without our knowledge, our wrong endings had some had similar features as with like fake reviews. So they had made this, you know, kind of a very interesting, um, uh, you know, observation and they had leveraged that and turned out that you could do, you know, really much better if you just, just train a classifier that just detects the, the, such features. So that was a very interesting outcome of that challenge that we ran. And still, you know, there was still a huge gap between human performance and their performance, which was around 70, like two, I think, or 76%. Uh, but it still was such a good example of what can go wrong when you collect data, right? For a narrow task, as I said, in AI. And this isn't something that has happened only to story close tests. Like other benchmarks in the field, such as um, natural language inference, NLI, or VQA, visual question answering, have basically showcased similar patterns that when we go about collecting data sets for test testing purposes, they could be really biased. and. Often those biases are not even revealed to us. If we are lucky, we will catch some of them, but often they're not revealed. And then, you know, we can go forward without knowing them and then patting ourselves on the shoulder that we are doing, you know, deep language understanding and like, you know, uh, just, you know, claim victory that we are surpassing, I don't know, things like human performance. Like, But the, the, the truth is that a narrow benchmarks are narrow in the sense that they, they don't really represent the world and we should be really careful with the way that we collect our data. Right. And I will, sorry, I will add this, that we were careful actually with the way we collected the story close this and still there were biases that there was no way we would have known ahead of time. So it again goes about saying how much more care as a community, as a research community, we should give to um, exploring, you know, different ways of collecting data and vetting them. And then, as I said, more so, I believe in the, in the power of try testing your systems on multiple frameworks and making sure that they scale beyond the particular training data that they're trained on or overfitted on, basically. You created this benchmark. Have you also uh, participated on the the other side of it, building out models to try to improve on the state of the art. Yeah. So actually, so the when uh, you know I worked on this, we had many different systems, as I said, uh, but they were none of them were doing fantastically. Uh, they were basically capped at sixty some percent. Uh, and then actually the most recent thing that we did after realizing that uh, with the you know new uh, results that were particularly shared in the challenge day was to come up with another data set so that uh, these hidden biases are kind of, uh, you know, taken care of. And so now, you know, uh, our research, the research team that I'm working on right now at Elemental Cognition, we are working on different kinds of stories that uh, are not exactly rocket stories, uh, but technically, you know, you can uh, test and, you know, evaluate uh, our system on rocket stories as well. But it's just a more challenging task that we are tackling right now than the story close test. Tell me about the the types of approaches that you would take uh, for you know either of these types of tasks. I guess when I hear semantic representation, the first thing that I think of from a deep learning perspective is like embeddings. Mm -hmm. um, are there does that come into play? Are there other yeah, what are the kinds absolutely. of techniques that come into play? 
Yeah, I will tell you about the the best model that we had, which was doing you know fifty nine percent when we released the data set. Basically, so that was a, a model that was basically as imagine a sentence embedding model. All it did was that uh, you want to build a model that um, embeds the context, which is four sentences, in the shared semantic space with the right ending. So basically we train these two parallel neural nets, one of which will embed the context, one of which will embed the ending. And at the end of the day, you wanted the uh, you know encoding of the right ending to be closer to the context than the wrong ending. So this is called this was called DSSM, a deep uh, semantic structure model uh, that did like the best within the you know multiple models that we had initially tried for this uh, story close test. And then actually I will go about saying that the current state of the art as as is about like you know released uh, uh, data points uh, about a month ago was from OpenAI where they had they have this nice uh, piece of work that is uh, you know transformers that are also pre-trained on like a large language model uh, that are doing actually really a good job 86 percent on the story close test. So that's that goes about telling you that uh, there is there, there are a lot of regularities that you can leverage by just you know reading a lot of corpora out there and building a language model. So that's so, sort of not exactly what I would have uh, predicted uh, in terms of uh, what would be the best model that can tackle uh, story understanding. But the recent results show that actually a very strong language model can do a good job in predicting the ending. With the language model that they trained, was it trained specifically for this task or was it trained generally like training an embedding space? Yeah, so the interesting thing about that work uh, actually was that, uh, which kind of makes it, you know, sets it apart from the other systems that have been submitted on our story close test benchmark, was that it was actually a generic language model, was this very big language model that is pre-trained and then tuned for our particular uh, story close test. So story close test comes with a validation and a test uh, set. So validation is what people usually use for for tuning purposes. But the nice, uh, as I said, the nice characteristic of OpenAI system was that it was a you know pre-trained generic language model. That is actually, I will add this that I told you that we have now we are working on releasing a new uh, story close test uh, version. Uh, a new version of the data set that uh, kind of bypasses and uh, helps with, uh, you know, improving the kind of biases that people had found out about the data set. And we tested the OpenAI system and it was the only system that was still having a very high performance on the new data set, which goes about saying that turns out the other, uh, you know, submitted systems were actually leveraging the biases as opposed to doing true language understanding. Is there a way to characterize whether the the open AI system is just better at leveraging biases, you know, as opposed to be, kind right? of true that's, understanding? Um, is there a way yeah, to... that's a very good point. And I actually I I do think that there's no way for us whether or not there are some hidden biases in in any of the data sets that we are benchmarking our progress on. And until we get to a point that we can really deploy a system in the wild and see that they can basically model different kind of complex inputs and then generate different kinds of complex outputs, there's no way of guaranteeing that, right? I'm, I'm sure that our new data set that we are about to release also has, has new biases that we are not aware of, right? And there's a very good chance that the open AI system, as an example, is just doing a better job at, you know, again, like memorizing different sorts of uh, ir- irregularities that are hidden. Um, so I think there's just, just really no way of knowing that. But I guess as long as at least we have better practices in place for, uh, you know, t- t- testing and evaluating our systems on a variety of benchmarks, we are in a better shape. One of the points you raised earlier was the idea of systems that can explain themselves. Now, that can mean a lot of different things, but one of the things that it can mean is that a system like this open AI system or some other system with this capability can uh, describe, you know, why it is uh, producing the the sentence that it's producing or choosing mm-hmm. the sentence that it's, that it's choosing. Uh, is that when you say explain, uh, is that the 
the focus mm-hmm. of your work? Yeah, exactly. So uh, as I said, uh, the outcome of the challenge that we ran on the story closed us was a, was kind of an eye opening for me personally to think beyond like classification tasks. And, you know, with a few of my colleagues, we had a lot of back and forth and the consensus was that if we build AI systems that not only choose choose the right whatever their you know uh, space they're provided with, uh, cho- choose the right uh, ending in the context of story closeness, but also explain why they did that, so that we can basically probe them, we can see whether or not their decision makes sense. Because as I said, for instance, in the case of the team that the UW team that was leveraging the features, the uh, you know stylistic features, the system can't explain that I chose this because it had more number of adjectives versus adverbs, or it had like I don't know like eight words as opposed to five. Right? right. It should say something that is logically sound to a human reader. Uh, so that's yeah. Back to your point. That's exactly what I mean by explanation, and I do think that uh, ex. Explanation is uh, this cognitive ability that as humans we have and working on the next generation of AI systems that can explain themselves is not really only for the sake of, say, evaluation or for the sake of, uh, I don't know, like there are now these regulations in, say, EU that push for AI systems not to be black boxes, but it's really about uh, modeling this human capability and this cognitive ability that we have as humans, because explaining is a way that we showcase our intelligence often, and we have to have AI systems that can just portray that. And so there are different ways of approaching that. Some take the explanations from an intrinsic perspective and try to Mm -hmm. introspect on the actual model that's doing the deciding and and put what it sees there into words and others take more of a, an external perspective and try to apply some other model to the primary model to generate explanations. Mm-hmm. How does your work in this space approach that uh, distinction? Yeah, so I personally, th- this is my my personal view. I personally, first and foremost, I believe that nat- uh, the explanation should be in natural language form, right? So there are different pieces of work, of a lot also in the vision and language community, that they uh, basically count your um, attention features as the way of explaining why a system, you know, say chooses a particular you know, outcome versus another. But I count uh, natural language explanations as a reasonable uh, way of interfacing with human. Uh, So back to your question about uh, there being two disjoint uh, modules that will, one of which will do the prediction, let's say one of which will do the generation. I would say that I'm not against uh, either of those. It could be a disjoint model, it could be a joint model, but as long as uh, the uh, system can actually somehow provide the explanation that uh, makes sense to the uh, human that is judging whether or not it makes sense, it, it could be still useful. So there are different ways of looking at explanation, right? Is it for uh, basically trying to diagnose, diagnose like why a system makes a particular uh, decision? Is it for improving the system? Is it, w- what is the purpose, right? And I would say that At the end of the day, as long as the system can improve, for instance, through the interaction it has with human for explaining themselves uh, itself, why do we care if there are two just you know different just you know modules that one of which is generating the explanation and one is one of which is doing the uh, prediction? But at the end of the day, as I said, I think we can take um, explanation as a way of uh, knowing whether or not the system can uh, tell us what's going under the hood. And if a system chooses to have diff- two different modules, that's just a, you know, uh, uh, basically an implementation decision. But I can't imagine a successful system that doesn't have those two modules communicate with each other. So again, but I'm not, uh, you know, opposed to the idea. Uh, so thus far, we've talked primarily about natural language understanding aspects of contextual modeling, uh, but you recently presented at CVPR on some multimodal work incorporating both language and vision. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Sure, absolutely. So as I said, the um, you know work on event-centric contextual modeling can, has different applications. So we talked about story understanding. Another application of it for my work has been on language and vision. Uh, so the language and vision community has seen a lot of uh, interest has received a lot of interest in the past like couple of years, basically after you know deep learning uh, growth, uh, which is because you know we can just basically have better ways of encoding images, which is very you know nicely uh, f- something that you can nicely feed into a recurrent model that f- with which you can generate language. So that's more more so what my work has been around as well. So image captioning has been the uh, most uh, popular application in vision and language since the beginning, which is about how would you build an AI system that will caption it in a given image very literally. So how would you literally describe what you see in a photo? Uh, so my work has been mainly focused on going beyond literal description and getting uh, more so towards a t- kind of vision and language tasks that require some sort of some degree of common sense reasoning. Uh, So to give you an example, uh, the very first work I started on vision and language was about this uh, static image. Imagine, I'm just, you know, describing it basically now. Imagine this aesthetic photo you see of uh, two policemen with a fallen motorcycle on the ground. And as human beings, when we see this, right, the three set is aesthetic objects, right? Two policemen and a fallen uh, motorcycle, Uh, from these three aesthetic objects, we go beyond, we connect the dots and we infer that, oh, there should be a notion of injury or, oh, there should have been a motorcyclist, right? Or, oh, like there should have been an accident here. So these kind of connections that we make are really interesting and it wasn't something that was already uh, explored in the research community. Uh, so we basically defined this task called visual question generation that uh, what it does is it uh, focuses on mm, building an AI system that give an aesthetic image that happens to be event-centric, meaning that something's happening in the image, what is the most natural first question that pops to your mind, given that image? So that's basically the VQG work that I did that started off a series of other vision and language projects that I worked on. And, you know, I will go about asking you, so what would be the most natural question that you would ask given the image that I just described to you? Uh, at the highest levels, like what happened? Yeah, what happened? Exactly. So we understand that something should have gone wrong or should have occurred that, you know, caused that scene. Yeah, what happened? Is the motorcyclist alive? How, like, serious was the injury? Stuff like that are the most common things that people ask. And it was the kind of, a you know, task that we wanted to push for to go beyond literal description. Mm. And so how do you go about tackling that? Yeah, so we basically built it. First and foremost, you need data, right? So we collected our own data set called VQG, which was on more more so on event centric uh, images. We queried like Bing search engine to get uh, images that have something happening in them, say fire, earthquake, injury, stuff like that, or an accident. And then using that data, we built this uh, model that gets as an input the feature vector of an image, uh, which you know could be a convolutional neural net. And then given that, just train a, a language model, basically a conditional language model that will just generate the, the text description. Uh, which is happens to be a question here. So we actually leveraged existing uh, image captioning uh, models and just basically tuned them and retrained them on our own data. And it was, you know, semi-successful in asking relevant questions given an eventful image. And so with the data set you curated, you had these images of uh, events, things that, that happened, and then you had... A single caption for each image? Uh, we, uh, our data actually comes with five uh, questions per given image. Uh, but, you know, it could have been anything, right? It just happens that ours was five um, just for the t- training purposes. We had we collected fi- 15,000 of such images, each paired with five questions. And is the task structured in such a way that it's... Uh, 
classification or generation of a new sentence based on? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. It is generation here. And as it goes with uh, any generation task, you have the problem of, okay, how would you even evaluate, uh, which is a major, you know, problem in the community. Uh, so here we, we just, you know, try different metrics that are classically used in the vision and language community. There are different metrics. You know, you can use blue, you can use uh, meteor. Uh, we just use Delta blue, which happened to correlate the best with the human judgment. So can you elaborate on, on that? What is Delta blue? What are the inputs to that? Of course. So these are metrics, right? There's no like, it's not no uh, AI, like nothing is being trained. It's just a, w- a, a metric for evaluating a, a generated output versus some gold standards, which is an inherent problem because for so many tasks, there's no limited set of uh, possible, uh, you know, gold answers as it goes for this, right? There's so many different questions you can ask given an image. But at the end of the day, uh, you, you you know, as in research community, at least, what you have to resort to is to define a set of predefined, you know, uh, limited set of predefined uh, questions here. Even there, there are so many ways to ask the same question, let alone Definitely, exactly, different exactly. types of questions that you <laughs> yeah, could ask for about exactly. a situation. Exactly, which goes goes to saying that to what I just said that it's just inherently problematic. We do. I would say that we yet don't know how to evaluate language generation, okay. uh, which is not machine translation. So in machine translation, right. even although even in machine translation, blue, which is this metric of how would you uh, evaluate how good of a tra- job you've done at translation, there even people use blue, which which you know there, there are different pieces of work that show that even that doesn't correlate with human uh, judgment that strongly. But even in machine translation, the, ta- the task is much more defined, right? The semantic content of the source language is really close to the semantic content of the, uh, you know, the language that you're going to, whereas in dialogue or in story generation or in this vision and language test that I just talked about, it's not, nothing is, uh, you know, set. Uh, predefined. So we have this major problem, which goes, uh, again, goes back to, to the story I was telling you for the story close test that we, we decided to go with the classification task because generation inherently is hard to evaluate and classification gives us this ability to systematically evaluate. Um, so yeah, anyways, with uh, the uh, you know, st- the language and vision work that I told you about, we, used, we ended up using Delta Blue, which is this metric for uh, basically counting the number of words that occur in the generated uh, output versus the gold uh, few human authored, uh, you know, questions that you have in hand. So you generate a question based on the image you, and you're evaluating the performance of, or you're evaluating that question based on Delta Blue and presumably mm-hmm. your crowdsourcing the gold standard answers exactly yes it's it just comes from the the data set right so the fifteen thousand data you know points that we collected we set aside a portion of that for test where that the the blue uh you know human authored uh, gold um questions come from and so for your implementation of a, a system to do this what was the general approach you took um, the general approach, as I said, was this uh, model that includes the image using a convolutional neural net and then ah, generates right. the, say that. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no worries, and then generates uh, a sequence of words using a recurrent neural net. Uh, and these are, you know, there's this uh, recurrent neural net language models are really strong in uh, generating grammatical outputs, meaning local coherent coherency. But they are not really good at uh, capturing intricacies and generating basically contentful sentences. As you may have seen, you know, if you look at the uh, kind of language that chatbots generate or a lot of such vision and language uh, work, pieces of work, uh, often the, the generations are bland, meaning that they're, you know, they're usually safer on the safe first side Mm -hmm. they don't have a lot of contentful words or events and stuff like that Uh, but they do a really good job in generating uh, coherent uh, sentences and did your work uh, try to address that 
Yeah, so there are different. So we did, you know, we did try different things. It's just the, the uh, you know, the question is, okay, I have this system that generates different kinds of output. People usually have this n best list that they re-rank. So basically, when you are generating, at the end of the day, you can have a, you know, search, right? And then the question is how to do that search better so that you hit the, uh, ones that are more contentful. So there are like different little tricks in the paper we had at the for the uh, VQG work, visual question generation that I just told you about. We had this very simple heuristic that uh, if uh, if in your n best list you have a sentence that has verbs in it, give it a higher rank. Or if it, you have a longer sentence, it's most possibly a better sentence. And then you put all these different yeah, features together and then you tune your model. You use MERT, but there are different kind of you know, rankers you can use out there. But, you know, it's not a solve. It's a, it's a serious problem we have uh, for the, you know, basically these kind of recurrent neural net generations. And, and when you described this earlier, you, I think you described it as a conditional language model. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So you have to have a way of conditioning on the input right here. The input is the image. The input could have been anything, right? In the case of story generation, the input could be the previous sentence. Uh, here, uh, we want to generate using the image. So we condition the generation of the language on the feature vector of the image. I'm trying to to visualize what that looks like or how that mm -hmm. is implemented you know, when I think about RNNs and time steps and all that kind of stuff, where does the the feature vector of the image come into play? Or is that the input at these time yeah. steps? Yeah. So uh, the, the very last model we tried for the VQG task, actually, uh, what it got as the input was the FC7 feature of the, you know, like in the convolution or neural net, one of uh, you know, slices that you can get is, is like FC7. So this fully uh, connected layer is what we fed into the uh, RNN as the just for the very first step. You can actually feed that in uh, for all the steps. That's something we tried. We just got worse results. We just conditioned the very first uh, time step on that. But as I said, that's a that's a decision that you can make by uh, just just trial and error. Awesome. We have covered a ton of ground. Are there any other things that um, you might want to mention about your current research areas? Um, yeah, I think we covered a lot. Uh, I think that uh, what I would conclude this, this um, you know, today's time with is to just mention that I, I've chosen to work on the topics in AI that I found to be really challenging in terms of uh, the amount of work that still is needed to be done to even, you know, scratch the surface. Uh, so common sense reasoning happens to be one of them. There's a consensus in the field these days that uh, we, we yet don't have an AI system that can even have the common sense understanding of a, you know, four or five-year-old kid let alone an actual a human like adult. And I think that uh, the kinds of work on like story understanding, story generation, or the vision and language tasks that are event-centric uh, go about, you know, at least going one step uh, beyond the existing uh, efforts for doing something that is a little bit more challenging. And I think it's important to be mindful of how far we've come, which is to tackle a lot of uh, you know, previously challenging, uh, I would say, um, uh, you know, kind of perception tasks, but we really have a long way going forward doing uh, more of a reasoning and cognitive tasks, which is my my personal research interest. And I think a lot more, in the, you know, people in the community should pay attention to it. Well, Nasrin, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. For more information on Nasreen or any of the topics covered in this episode, visit twimmelaicom slash talk slash 174. If you're a fan of the podcast, please pop open your Apple or Google podcast app and leave us a five-star rating and review. Your ratings are a great way to help new listeners find the show. As always, thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.